Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. And uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and if you're coming in, uh, please don't be shy. Move to the front. Uh, uh, we'd love to have you up close. Uh, so I'm Noel Fine. Uh, I'm from Calgary, uh, and uh, we have my co-chair for this session is Dr. Devinder Jassel uh, from the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. This session is a uh, imaging session uh, uh, for cardiac amyloidosis, which uh, has been a very hot topic uh, this year, and uh, a number of sessions. Uh, and this one will delve into the imaging nuances, and we have four great speakers uh, for you this morning, so uh, we're very excited to, to get going. Um, so I'll let Dr. Jassel introduce our first speaker. So perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, again, for those who are sitting at the back, if you want to come closer, because I think they gave us the second largest room today to uh, listen to our talks. The objectives are basically to understand the roles of echocardiography, uh, cardiac MRI, nuclear imaging in our patients with cardiac amyloid. And we're going to also uh, learn what are the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the various imaging uh, platforms for this. So our first uh, presenter today is uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Francois Ternou. Uh, we train together at Mass General Hospital. He is currently an assistant professor here in cardiology uh, in Montreal. Uh, his uh, expertise is in heart failure and echocardiography, and without further ado. Thank you very much. Start. Okay. So, um, my lecture will be about when to suspect the diagnosis when you read an echocardiogram. So, Amyloidosis is uh, characterized by a, pre a misfolded precursor protein that uh, leads to uh, amyloid fibers. And there are different proteins which can lead to uh, amyloidosis, but typically cardiac involvement is associated with either with the transuretin protein or immunolite chain aggregation. So at the level of the heart, um, these amyloid fibers can be seen within the myocardium, and it will create hypertrophy, ventricular dysfunction, left atrium enlargement and dysfunction. At the level of the endocardium, and the vas will look thickened, and you can see mitral tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, at the level of the vessels, and it's going to create some ischemia. And within the pericardium, and you will see some pericardial effusion. So within the next 10 minutes, I will describe <clears throat> all these echo features which can help you to suggest the diagnosis. So the first thing I learned about echo and amyloidosis when I was a young resident was about the appearance of the myocardium. And I show you here this paper almost 40 years ago uh, talking about the gra granular sparkling texture of the myocardium. Now, this is a video loop that I took when uh, I was at the end of my training in 2011. And at that time, with the machine, we could still appreciate this uh, granular sparkling texture. The thing is, now, with our new machine in 2019, and all those moving algorithms they put inside, we don't even have the focus anymore, um, it's beca it becomes very hard to know exactly who is who? So this is amyloidosis, this is not amyloidosis. So really granular sparkling is not really specific. Left ventricular hypertrophy is expected in these patients with cardiac amyloidosis, and you can see all the levels of uh, hypertrophy. It can be very mild, like in this uh, patients with white type ATTR amyloidosis, where the progression of the disease is very slow. And in this example, the thickness of the wall is only between 12 and 13 millimeters. Or you can have a severe hypertrophy, like in this patient. Is there any anatomical features to help you to distinguish this hypertrophy from another cause? Not really. When you look at the texture of the myocardium, you can't really tell what's a, uh, what is the difference. Biventricular hypertrophy is much more striking. 
Usually, when we read our echo, we are talking about right ventricular dilatation, right ventricular function, but we usually forget to talk about how thick the right ventricular wall is. So there is not so many diseases which give you a biventricular hypertrophy. So this is really a key uh, point in your reading when you uh, try to suspect the diagnosis. Systolic function, well, left ventricular ejection fraction is usually preserved, but don't forget that in about one third of our patients, some of them have a can have a significant level of LV dysfunction. Preserved LV function is not equal with um, preserved stroke volume. And because you have a very strong concentric cardiac remodeling, the cavity becomes smaller, so the stroke volume is small. And in fact, it's something that you really need to report uh, in your uh, reading because it has some prognostic value, as it has been shown here. The lower the stroke volume is, the uh, worse the prognosis of your patient will be. And the last point of, about systolic function, and I'm sure some of you already heard about it, is about this typical uh, pattern of global longitudinal strain, because that's the cherry on the top. Um, it's because there is a gradient of longitudinal strain between the base of the left ventricle and the apex. Now, the pathophysiology to explain this pattern is not completely well understood. One of the hypotheses is that uh, amyloid fibrils first deposit at the level of the base and slowly go towards the apex. Now, this pattern is nice because it can help you to distinguish uh, different causes of hypertrophy. So here you have four patients with amyloid cardiomyopathy. Here you have two patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and you can see that the low value of the strain are uh, uh, where the hypertrophy is. And here are two patients with aortic stenosis. And on these two patients, the global longitudinal strain map is more heterogeneous. The team of uh, Jim Thomas at the Cleveland Clinic showed that the gradient between the apex and the base in terms of global longitudinal strain is a good marker to diagnose cardiac amyloidosis. There's a good sensitivity for this, mark, for this uh, marker, and there's pretty good specificity, but as you can see, specificity is not perfect. So if you see this pattern, it doesn't really necessarily mean it's cardiac am amyloidosis for sure. One other important thing to report is what is the value of the apical strain, because the French group showed that this value has a strong prognosis uh, is, a, is a strong prognosis factor for the follow-up of your patient. So when you suspect the diagnosis, when you read the echo, you can report the global longitudinal strain, but report also the apical strain. What about RV strain? Well, there are a few groups starting working on it, and they show that basically you find the same pattern uh, with this gradient from the base to the apex for the right ventricle. And uh, European team showed that the value of the global longitudinal strain on, for the right ventricle has also a prognostic value. In terms of diastolic dysfunction, well, more than 80% of our patients have diastolic dysfunction. Usually they have a, a very strong restrictive filling pattern. The left ventricular filling pressure are pretty high, and as you can see here, there is almost no relaxation. What about the valves? Well, I said, mentioned earlier that uh, the valves are thickened, and you can see mitral regurgitation, you can see uh, tricuspid regurgitation, and the amyloid fibrils are also involved in the progression of uh, the arctic stenosis. In this uh, paper of um, Columbia University, where they actively screened their patient with severe aortic stenosis undergoing TAVI, they show that 16% of this patient had ATTR cardiac amyloidosis, especially in the group with uh, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. 
So when you read this kind of echo pre tavi think about cardiac amyloidosis. And if you, know, if you want to know a little bit more about the relationship uh, between aortic stenosis and cardiac amyloidosis, I invite you to read this review will be published soon in JAK um, that uh, Dr. Pibaro and my colleague Thibaut Bodami uh, worked on with me. In terms of left atrium, usually the left atrium is enlarged. The anterior atrial septum is uh, thickened, and some group show some interesting research showing that the function of the left atrium is already impaired. This is still at the level of research. We are talking about left atrium strain, but it's starting to be pretty interesting. Finally, in terms of pericardial effusion, more than half of our patients have a little bit of severe pericardial effusion. And you, as you can see in this poor patient with AL amyloidosis, you can even see the amyloidosis this um, amyloid fibril deposit within the uh, pericardium. So this is something that uh, you know, can uh, also help you to suspect the diagnosis. Can we echo distinguish AL from editor amyloidosis? The answer is no. As you can see here in this study published in 2017, there is no uh, specific characteristic which can really help you to distinguish the two forms of the disease. One thing is when you look for cardiac amyloidosis uh, and the request says have PEF, think, I mean, sorry, think about cardiac amyloidosis when the request say have PEF. Why? It's because this uh, Spanish group uh, actively screen all their patients with heart failure, preserved ejection fraction, and you know a little bit of uh, wall thickness, so greater than 12 millimeters. And doing this, they found that 13% of their patients had cardiac amyloidosis. And we started to do that also in our um, echo lab, and we roughly got the same numbers. So um, you know when the patient, when the request form for the echo say heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, think about cardiac amyloidosis. When you read an echo, uh, it's nice to read all the images, but try to use everything uh, in the medical uh, chart. Um, especially, you know, you can just look at the EKG. And when you look, when you see this kind of patients with wall thickness, but micro voltage on the EKGs, the discrepancy between the two tests should raise the, uh, possible, the possibility of the diagnosis. Finally, don't forget that amyloidosis is a systemic disease. In our lab, the patient cannot leave the lab until we are finished by reviewing all the images. So when we suspect amyloidosis, when we finish to review the images, most of the time we go check the patient. And I ask the patient, show me your tongue. At the beginning, the patient kind of surprised, but you know, there are a few very simple clinical features that you can check, uh, and so it can help you to finish your report. So to conclude, you have to look for all these echo uh, red flags to suspect the disease. Look at pericardial effusion, look at thick right ventricle, look at thick valves, look at thick uh, anterior septum, check the diastolic function, check the systolic function, look for uh, low stroke volume, look for the um, cherry on the top, and when you are looking at patients with uh, arctic stenosis, have a special um, look for the one who have low flow, low gradient arctic stenosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. Uh, we have time for any questions. We'll take one or two. Just come to the mic and introduce yourself. If not, Francois, a quick question to ask. In terms of the um, sensitivity specificity of the uh, apical strain where you have the apical sparing, um, I guess for the audience, how sensitive specific is it for cardiac amyloid versus another infiltrative cardiomyopathy? So example, you have a patient with Fabry's disease, you have a patient with uh, sarcoidosis. 
is the apical sparing truly sensor specific for cardiac amyloid, or would we, would we see that in other infiltrated cardiac myopathies? So um, the sensitivity is pretty good. Uh, one thing that some iterant group showed that if, for example, if you have two diseases, if you have aortic stenosis and cardiac amyloidosis, sometimes the apical sparing disappear because the aortic stenosis, the pattern of global longitudinal strain linked to the aortic stenosis will overlap the pattern of cardiac amyloidosis. Um, in terms of specificity, we can see this kind of pattern in over cardiac hypertrophy. Like, I have a few hypertensive patients with very strong hypertrophy who have exactly the same pattern. And so if you see that, you can think, well, do, we have, do I have an over echo feature to raise the diagnosis? But you cannot just say, if I have just that, for sure it's cardiac disease. It's not specific enough. And then again, to distinguish it, amongst the other infiltrated cardiomyopathies? Well, um, f compared to uh, f Fabry disease or this kind of thing, um, personally, I, didn't, I don't have a court large enough to, um, to comment about that, but I would say, you know, it's probably, um, it, c it can probably help you to distinguish the two because the epical sparing, the fact that the deposit of amyloid fibrils is mostly at the base, create probably a pattern which you cannot really see in our disease. Sure. Please. If you could just, uh, uh, I don't know if you can hear my voice. Can we have the uh, microphone activated here at the front? Yeah, Great. so uh, if you are to, uh, say, classify or uh, grade the uh, signs that you see in uh, an echo for amyloidosis, uh, of which one is more specific and which one is least specific or in terms of sensitivity so that we have like a guideline. As you know, sometimes at the end stage of amyloidosis, maybe the EF is no longer spared, you know, so it becomes a bit dilated. So we don't know where we are. So if you could have these signs, uh, you know, just uh, classify. So, so the, the thing is, my personal opinion, it's more constellation of echo features. Um, if you have one or two features, it's hard to raise the diagnosis. If you have constellation of the different features, that really helps you. But I agree with you, when, you, when these patients are at the end of the disease, sometimes you don't even have epical sparing at all anymore because the disease is everywhere. So you, it's really, um, you have to use everything in front of you to help yourself. What we do usually, um, we access the medical chart of the patient and look at the EKG, look what the uh, referral physician mentioned, or uh, for example, there's a history of uh, carpal tunnel surgery, uh, etc. But uh, yeah, there's no um, feature will tell you for sure this is cardiac amyloidosis. Okay, we're going to move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Sarah Blissett. Uh, Sarah, or is it Blisset en français? English, as Dr. Sarah Blissett then. Uh, she is going to be uh, discussing the role of cardiovascular MRI and how it provides complementary information. Uh, Sarah has uh, completed her uh, fellowship training in multimodality cardiac imaging, is now doing congenital heart disease. Sarah. Thank you very much for the invitation and the kind introduction. In terms of disclosures, I receive a speaker honorarium from Survey Canada. Over the next 12 minutes, I'd like to focus on the role of cardiac MRI in the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis, review some of the typical and additional imaging features identified on MRI of cardiac amyloid, and then highlight some of the practicalities of MRI in diagnosing cardiac amyloid. So we recognize that there are multiple subtypes of amyloidosis, and we most commonly talk about AL amyloidosis and ATTR amyloidosis, which is further subdivided into mutant and wild type, recognizing that there are other, also less common causes of amyloid. And identifying the subtype is important because it has implications for therapy, which have really evolved in the recent years. So where does MRI fit in in making a diagnosis? 
Many groups have proposed these pathways or treatment and diagnostic algorithms uh, trying to incorporate the biochemical markers as well as the various imaging modalities. And while there are subtle differences, I think one thing that's common is that MRI can be used to raise our clinical suspicion that the patient has cardiac amyloidosis. And recently, a consensus paper was published highlighting potential criteria for diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. And aside from the patients who have endomyocardial biopsy, we see that typical imaging features are part of making a diagnosis for ATTR and AL amyloid when there's an extra cardiac biopsy or in making a clinical diagnosis of ATTR cardiac amyloid. And the authors of this statement propose that cardiac amyloid could be used anywhere from the asymptomatic stage where patients have known amyloid, either by gene positive testing or AL amyloid, or when they are symptomatic and you're thinking about what is the etiology of this patient's heart failure and there are other clinical features. And I think we'll hear later in the session about using MRI for biopsy proven cardiac amyloid. So what are these typical MRI imaging features of cardiac amyloid? And the authors of this group propose that there are four, including elevated LV wall thickness, abnormal gadolinium kinetics, late gadolinium enhancement, and an expanded ECV of more than 0.4. Importantly, these last three require administration of gadolinium. So we can use CINE SSFP thickness uh, SSFP synase uh, to look for the LV wall thickness at end diastole, in addition to measuring the LV mass, looking at the RV hypertrophy, in addition, the RV size, the RV function, LV volume, LV function, atrial dimensions, thickening of the interatrial septum or valves, and pericardial or pleural effusions. Importantly, these images are comprised of data from multiple cardiac cycles. And that has implications for us as we image these patients because the images could be degraded if the patient's having difficulty with their breath holds or, as in this uh, case, the patient was in atrial fibrillation with varying RR intervals and it can make it more challenging to measure the LV wall thickness. Gadolinium is an extracellular-based compound. And in normal myocardium, we would not expect to see any gadolinium present in the tissues if we were to image 10 minutes after administration. But if, as in the case of amyloid, there was an expanded extracellular matrix where that gadolinium could accumulate, then we could uh, see the hyperenhancement on late gadolinium imaging. The first part of imaging for late gadolinium enhancement is trying to find the T1 time at which the myocardium is nulled. And when we look at these uh, T1 uh, scout images, we can find an interesting pattern in patients with amyloid. Normally, the myocardium nulls after the blood pool. So you can see here that the blood pool is dark and the myocardium still has signal. But in patients with amyloid, it's the reverse, and that the myocardium actually nulls prior to the blood pool, or you can have a very difficult time even nulling the myocardium. The pattern of the late gadolinium enhancement can be used for tissue characterization and distinguishing from other kinds of patients with ha which have thick LV walls. So the typical pattern in ischemia is subendocardial or transmural, LGE, and a coronary distribution. And you can see that there are various patterns seen in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. And the classic pattern in amyloid is that of global subendocardial hyperenhancement. And this distinguishes it from other similar causes of left ventricular th uh, increased thickness, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and in Fabry, which have different LGE patterns. The classic pattern described is a subendocardial hyperenhancement, which often starts at the base, and then as the disease progresses, moves more apically, corresponding nicely to what we just heard about the cherry on top pattern and strain and echo. But there you can also have patchy LGE or even more extensive and diffuse myocardial LGE where it looks like almost the entire myocardium is involved. And the sensitivity and specificity are 85% and 92% respectively. We can also see LGE in other areas like the atria. Patients with amyloid can have expanded global extracellular volume with a value of more than 0.4 being proposed and normal being less than 0.25 to 0.29. And the basis here is that amyloid infiltration should expand the ECV, and gadolinium accumulates an ECV, and gadolinium also shortens the T1 time. 
So we can then estimate the ECV by comparing the T1 time pre and post gadolinium administration with this calculation. That also involves knowing the patient's measured hematocrit within about 24 hours of the exam, and we can use this to create ECV maps. I think importantly to note that ECV can be abnormal even if there's no LGE present. And this has implications for us as we try to identify patients who have cardiac amyloidosis earlier in their disease state. There are pitfalls of using gadolinium. Uh, one is that its use in uh, patients with renal impairment um, raises some concern as earlier gadolinium agents carried a risk of developing nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, particularly in patients who had EGFRs less than 30 or were on uh, dialysis. With newer agents, this is evolving. Uh, and uh, now locally at UCSF, as long as the patient does not have AKI, uh, even if they're on dialysis or have an EGFR of less than 30, uh, we're administering uh, the new gadolinium agents to them. But this is likely site dependent. There's also concerns of long-term accumulation of gadolinium in the bone and the brain of unclear clinical significance at this point. And practically, it does take time to complete this protocol. So are there any other additional MRI features that we could use? Maybe if uh, we were imaging in a center that was not administering uh, gadolinium to patients with renal dysfunction, that is common in amyloid. So we could use the prolonged native T1 time, which is really a measure of after we excite the protons, how long does it take for them to come back to their natural state? And the T1 time is prolonged if there's interstitial fibrosis or edema. And you might be wondering, well, how long is prolonged? but it really depends on the scanner and the sequence. So in this in cohort in 2013, a time of more than 1,040 milliseconds on a 1.5 T scanner using the shortened MOLLE sequence had a diagnostic accuracy of 92%. We recognize that T1 times are often longer on 3T magnets, and in a cohort of patients with known cardiac amyloid, they found a median Three, or T1 time on a 3T magnet of 1,438 milliseconds. And some groups have proposed using the native T1 time to stratify whether or not patients need uh, to receive gadolinium contrast, and that would be site-specific as well. We can also combine the native T1 time and ECV to have a better understanding of that patient's myocardium, seeing that patients with amyloid often have expanded ECVs and quite prolonged uh, native T1 times, and that distinguishes them from other causes of left ventricular hypertrophy. There is emerging data on using a prolonged T2 time. The T2 time can be increased in cases of edema, uh, and one group in a cohort of patients consisting of both AL and ETTR amyloid found that they had prolonged T2 times, which is interesting um, from a pathophysiology perspective, but I think remains an area of research interests uh, rather than clinically uh, used routinely. The main pitfall of using T1 and T2 mapping is the scanner and sequence specific cutoffs and the importance of normalizing local reference ranges and comparing your values to those normal local reference ranges. So I'd just like to close by discussing some of the practicalities of using MRI in diagnosing cardiac amyloidosis. The first is that I've sort of alluded to this already, that some of the protocols may vary by institution or based on the patient. And although we can highlight um, what we think the sequences could be, there may be local factors, um, such as whether or not they have parametric techniques widely available or using them in a, on all patients, whether they're imaging on 1.5 versus 3T, or whether or not gadolinium is administered to that patient. Importantly, we are focusing on a timely diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis, and in some centers there may be challenges and tensions between access to cardiac MRI to make that timely, di timely diagnosis. So I think it's important to recognize the local resources and create either set goals for the timelines for when these patients should be imaged, imaged from the referral to the MRI, um, or also influence how you work up patients with amyloidosis. And importantly, MRI characteristics cannot reliably distinguish AL from ATTR amyloid, and some groups have recognized this and suggested that we state that explicitly in MRI reports. So with this, I'd like to just close by summarizing that the role of cardiac MRI in diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis helps us raise our clinical suspicion of cardiac MRI 
or sorry, of cardiac amyloidosis and helps us evaluate other potential differentials. And I think this is really helpful if the echo or other clinical parameters are not 100% um, in favor of amyloid and there's some uncertainty. We reviewed the typical and additional MRI imaging features of cardiac amyloid and some of the practicalities of using MRI to diagnose cardiac amyloidosis. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'd welcome any questions. So thank you, Sarah. A quick question, I guess, is in terms of access to cardiac MR, obviously when the diagnosis of cardiac amyloid is made, you want that patient to be seen by your hematology colleagues uh, as soon as possible. And with many wait lists of cardiac MRI across the country, three to six months uh, as an outpatient, it may be difficult to get the MR. The question, I guess, is if we can diagnose cardi um, cardiac amyloid fairly confidently using the echocardiographic techniques that we already heard from uh, Dr. Trunou, do all patients need cardiac MR or should we just be jumping to the pyrophosphate scanning? Mm -hmm. um, so I think my perspective on um, answering that uh, question um, has really um, been um, informed by going to the U.S. where you can get a cardiac MRI pretty much the same day that it's requested and really highlighted the differences between local centers. So I really appreciate that there's this practicality that may limit the uh, widespread use of cardiac MRI in every patient that we're suspecting cardiac amyloid. So I think it's guided by the patient. And um, if uh, you think that the echo is classic or diagnostic for cardiac amyloidosis, then for diagnosis of cardiac amyloid, there may be less of a role for cardiac MRI, but perhaps there are other utilities of obtaining a baseline MRI. And I think that pushes us as imagers uh, to try to find ways to uh, triage the requests for these timely diagnoses and timely scans to be made. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next we, up we have Dr. Gary Small, and, uh, oops, going the wrong direction here. Dr. Small uh, comes to us uh, by way of the UK, uh, where he did his uh, initial training. And, sorry. Uh, and uh, then came to the Ottawa Heart Institute uh, to do more advanced training uh, in nuclear cardiology uh, and was in Thunder Bay for a couple years after that and then returned to the Ottawa Heart Institute where he's presently a clinician investigator there and he's going to be talking to us about the role of uh, nuclear imaging in uh, cardiac amyloidosis. Thank you, Dr. Fine, and, and thank you for uh, inviting me today to uh, present uh, on uh, cardiac amyloidosis. There we it's nice to, um, from a nuclear perspective, often time where we're the old-fashioned modality and uh, we're trying to uh, fight, fight our corner against echo and MR, and it's, it's very pleasant to have those, uh, those tables turn a little bit. So the question that faces is, is why and when to order nuclear cardiology? I have no financial relationships to disclose. So um, the objectives of my talk really are to look through why nuclear imaging in the area of advanced echo and uh, cardiac MRI. And you've heard some excellent talks already this morning about the use of echo and cardiac MRI within this um, condition. The other question is just alluded to really in, in terms of the algorithms that we have. There's numerous algorithms out there about how we should be investigating patients. And the question is, you know, where do you do nuclear within that algorithm? And then lastly, I thought I'd spend a few seconds just talking about the future applications of nuclear cardiology in cardiac amyloid. So you've heard described very nicely this morning that essentially with cardiac amyloid, there's two types. There's ATTR or transthyretin amyloidosis, which may exist in a wild type or inherited form. And then there's the light chain or AL cardiac amyloid. For the most part, in, in the, if you were a betting person, you would bet this would be wild-type amyloidosis when you examine their patients. And we'll come on how you can be more accurate in your diagnosis with blood testing as well as doing further imaging. And the, the real key to this presentation is that PYP or bone scintography is we, what we do in the US and, and in Canada can, is really the only modality with the accuracy to accurately distinguish between ATTR and AL. You've seen this data already. 
excellent review by Pegorilus. It sort of it does go over some of the questions that you asked in terms of you know is there a specific echo um, uh, indice that will help you to determine uh, either between AL or ATTR or whether or not this, which is the most accurate, has the best receiver operating characteristics between the two. I think to answer your question is it depends on, on what your population study, study it is. But in this review and, and article, what was interesting was that in terms of um, non-deformation characteristics, what the authors suggest was that actually those are better at, 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 at suggesting that maybe AL amyloidosis, whereas our deformation parameters are more suggestive of ATTR, but that is not accurate enough to make a clinical di distinction between the two. Similarly, with MR uh, uh, features, although that we see differences and some of these features are more common in ATTR versus AL, none of them have accurate enough receiver operator characteristics for you to be confident about distinguishing between the two. Not so with bone scintigraphy. So we, when we do PYP imaging with technetium PYP, there's two things that we look at. First is a visual scoring system, and this is graded between zero and three, and what we see three here is intense uptake in the heart greater than the ribs. Two would be uptake within the heart that's equal to the ribs, and then one is when the, uh, the uptake is less than the ribs, and then in, in zero where there's no cardiac uptake. We also do a semi-quantitative score, which has been more recently described, where we actually draw a circle in the heart, the same size circle in the contralateral lung, and we looked at the number of counts per pixel, and we look for a ratio of greater than or equal to 1.5 to make the diagnosis of ATTR amyloidosis. So I wanted to spend a couple of seconds just looking at how good these two mechanisms are in terms of sensitivity and specificities, again, to guide your confidence in this technique. So if we think about the visual scoring system, there's an excellent paper from 2016 that accumulated data from the UK, from Europe, and from the US, and 1,200 patients. Just under 400 of those that actually had endomyocardial biopsy. And so in the patients that had PYP from the US, it's accounted for about a quarter of those. You can see here, if we draw a line at, at grade one to make our diagnosis, so these patients above, we get a sensitivity of 99%. Our specificity here uh, suffers because there are patients who have AL amyloidosis that will have positive scans. If we draw a line at grade two, our sensitivity goes down to 87, but our specificity doesn't increase as much as we might hope. We can get rid of, of these false positive findings, though, if we do a blood test to rule out monoclonal antibodies. So we can do immunofixation, serum-free light chains on both urine and, and the serum to make sure the patient doesn't have a, a plasma cell dysgrasia. And if we do that, we get 100% specificity for ATTR with this technique. What about the other mechanism, the semi-quantitative scoring system? Again, excellent operating, receiver operating characteristics with a sensitivity of 92, specificity of 97%. And this was in a mixed combination of patients, so ATTR, AL, and LVH patients from multiple causes. Those findings have been incorporated into these two documents, which I recommend you look at if you're involved in amyloidosis care patients. Um, the first one uh, it, it also contains an excellent review of imaging and um, some of the diagnostic features, both on MR, echo, and nuclear. And the, the second one gives us more of an appropriate use criteria summary. Uh, Dr. Bliss has already explained that we are now in an era of making a diagnosis without biopsy. So traditionally, we may have looked for biopsy data, whether it's endomyocardial biopsy data or extracardiac biopsy data to make our diagnosis of cardiac amyloid. But because we have so much confidence in this technique that in the absence of a monoclonal antibody on either serum or urine, with typical cardiac imaging features, we can now make a diagnosis of ATTR amyloid with, without a biopsy. Other important features of those recommendations include this call by the American Society of Echo, by the Society of Cardiac MI, by our own Nuclear Cardiac Society, by the AHA as well, so heavyweight players to make our reporting uniform. And what we really ought to be looking for on our Echo, MR, and Nuclear reports is these three comments. And in case you're overwhelmed by this, it's very keen to what we do with diastolic dysfunction, which all of us have adopted now in terms of saying it's present, it's not present, or it's indeterminate. And I put it to you that this, this is possible for us to incorporate in our reports, and it would certainly help, I think, clinicians 
to uh, gauge the weight of the diagnosis based on what was seen. So to come, come to the point about well, when, when should we do what imaging within cardiac amyloidosis, so this is the algorithm that they, these four major societies recommend that we, but we do. So once we're suspicious for amyloidosis, and as you can see, increasingly, increasingly, we're recognizing that this disease is very prevalent, particularly in an elderly population with LVH. We then, we should, we should rule out plasma cell dyscrasia, perform our physical exam, as Dr. Turnwell said very elegantly, to look for any evidence of systemic amyloidosis. We should then evaluate for cardiac involvement. If you have access for cardiac MRI, then I think that that would be a very important part of this workup. It's, the other thing is not everybody is doing strain because of the burden that takes in terms of the lab, so you may need to go back and ask for a limited echo with extra strain. We aren't yet in an era of offering um, PET imaging for these people, but we'll spend a couple of seconds perhaps at the end talking about that. When, once we're at this stage and you do these two simultaneously, then, then we have to confirm what the amyloidosis type is, and I hope that I've convinced you that the only real way to do that is with uh, technetium pyrophosphate imaging. And obviously, once we've done that, it will go down different lines of therapy and management. Sometimes the question arises, well, who do you do an endomyocardial biopsy on? So these will be the grade one patients. So when we, when we have a grade one study on PYP, um, those patients may still require endomyocardial biopsy. Remember that 20% of patients will have both a monoclonal antibody and ATTR uptake on a PYP scan. And again, there are some false, occasionally uh, false negative scans. So I think if there's uncertainty with, with a grade zero scan, then again, an endomyocardial biopsy would be indicated. Um, the expert recommendations um, also point to appropriate use criteria. And as you look through this list of appropriate use criteria for uh, bone scanning, you can see that it covers nearly ev everything that we've already talked about. So screening for patients, if we're worried about patients with HFPEF, if we want to do follow-up on patients who we've already made the diagnosis. So th these appropriate use criteria are, are a large umbrella. Future directions identified within the uh, expert recommendations really focus on three things. And I think this is a call for us to do research develop registries. So earlier detection is important if we're going to um, make headways into preventing the development of HFPEF in later, um, later life. Quantitative assessment to assess how the treatments are working is important. And there's moves afoot both within PET and SPEC traces to do this. And then finally, there's this call for multi-center studies with larger patient cohorts to help us to determine where we should be imaging and, and perhaps more importantly, who we should be treating. So I want to end on this slide, which is simply just to state when and where, which was the question we started with. So uh, why do we do it? Well, in the, in the appropriate uh, clinical setting, uh, PYP imaging is highly sensitive and specific to diagnose ATTR amyloidosis. Um, to reiterate the point, in the absence of a light chain clone, a myocardial uptake of greater than grade two is diagnostic of ATTR, obviating the need for an endomyocardial biopsy. And lastly, really, uh, when do we order it? We want to do it when we want to make an early diagnosis. And you can imagine now, going back to your centers, this is going to be a, quite a number of your patients. Thanks very much for your attention. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Small, for that uh, excellent uh, summary. Um, I just have a question, uh, two-part question, actually. So as awareness of the PYP scan and its important in the diagnostic algorithm grows, a lot of centers uh, have come to recognize that they don't have readily available access to PYP. So I wonder if you could offer some tips uh, for centers that are trying to build this into their diagnostic approach. And the other question I have is that uh, as a workaround to this problem, some centers have used alternate uh, tracers, such as MDP, which is typically used now for, um, uh, for just bone scans. And so uh, I wonder if you could comment on that practice. So um, Dr. Fine and I didn't rehearse this, um, but we were discussing this the other day, so uh, I took the liberty to prepare an extra slide. So to answer the first question, I think that the issue with PYP scanning is it, it will necessitate time on the scanner. Uh, hopefully we can do it over the one hour protocol and not bring people back and repeat imaging at three hours. I think that it helps to sell the protocol, um, but it, it, is, it may take scanner time away from more lucrative uh, scanning, um, more, um, 
uh, protocol. So there is a, a, a need to involve the department and explain that these patients are very prevalent and that we have new therapy and it's an important condition. So I think there will be a logistics kind of management question around it. There has been some controversy about whether or not PYP is Health Canada approved. It is Health Canada approved for myocardial injury and scar imaging. And so then it becomes a nuance as well, not we call amyloidosis and myocardial injury. And some centers have stuck to that and, and had no problems ordering it. I think to come to your point about MDP imaging, so this is this bone tracer that's, that's used to look for bony metastases, MDP more commonly used. And some centers are using this as a workaround. And we really don't have a sense of its accuracy. So this, you can see here, there's only really four previous reports that use this. One showed that uh, uh, from Europe, in comparison to DPD, the European uh, diphosphonate that they used to make ATTR, 11 patients had both studies, and all 11 were zero for MDP, so zero utility in that study. There's been some smaller papers that have shown some uptake, and in those, the intensity is certainly less than either PYP or DPD. So it's not very good, it's not reliable, and I'm not sure that we know if it's any better um, than, than really chance to determine the two. So I can't recommend it. I think if you see it on the scan, then it's, it, you know, it, it confirms amyloidosis, but then what do you do about that? And, and do, you then, do you then need to move on? I think the centers that we're aware of that are doing this would then ask for a further center to do a PYP study. So in relation to uh, Dr. Fine's question, um, could anyone speak to how readily available the pyrophosphate imaging is currently in Canada? Sure. So um, there's a radio pharmaceutical lab in Calgary that will supply it. At the, so there's a little bit of a, drag, uh, a lag time between the supply reaching your pharmaceutical, whoever makes up your uh, local radio pharmaceuticals, there'll be a local radio pharmaceutical lab that will labor, label your compounds. So it's a matter of making sure that they can order the, from this lab in Calgary and then you know, they'll have to do a quality control on it to make sure it's labeled enough for then clinical use. And what we tend to do is batch ours together. We're actually still ordering ours from a company in the US and that involves going through Health Canada approval. Um, but what we do is we batch it so we can, we can get the, the most out of each vial for, in terms of the number of patients. So it is available, it's available and from a lab in Calgary and then it's a matter of having them liaise with uh, your own radio pharmaceutical lab to make it up. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Smart. You. It was excellent. Okay, and our last uh, speaker today is uh, Dr. Margot Davis. Uh, Dr. Davis is from the University of British Columbia, and uh, she trained there and did uh, additional training in cardio-oncology uh, and heart failure at Stanford, and then returned to UBC, uh, and has been very active in the Canadian Cardio-Oncology Network, uh, uh, as, as well is a co-chair of the upcoming position statement on cardiac amyloidosis, uh, and uh, is going to be talking to us today about uh, the use for prognostic assessment uh, of imaging modalities and, and ongoing surveillance. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be here today, and thank you all for uh, coming out to our workshop. So I have uh, my typical disclosure slide, but I'd like to call everybody's attention to my final disclosure here, which is that I am not an imager. I am a heart failure cardiologist. Um, and uh, I don't know, or nor do I have any interest in knowing, the difference between MAG and PSIR methods of looking at LGE. And so don't expect me to get into any specifics. I'm going to talk really about um, how I, as a clinician, um, can use uh, what comes in an imaging report, largely, um, to help uh, guide my patient care. So, you know, we always do start with the basics, which are clinical tools, and I think it's important that th this really be the foundation of assessing prognosis and progression of disease in, uh, in any group of patients, but uh, particularly patients with cardiac amyloidosis. And at the end of the day, as in many uh, populations where heart failure is a common problem, New York Heart Association functional class remains an important marker of prognosis and disease progression. And so you can see here in this uh, 
study from about 10 years ago um, in patients with uh, amyloidosis, uh, NYHA class was the only significant predictor uh, of mortality. Uh, where when you used it as a binary variable of uh, less, than, uh, less than or equal to 2 or more than 2, the hazard ratio of having NYHA class 3 or 4 was approximately 4. Um, other things that I think are important to keep in mind in the clinic that, uh, that sort of tell you how, how your patient is doing and where they're likely to go from here, heart rate uh, is, an, is a useful marker. Patients who are uh, tachycardic and sinus rhythm um, often, are, it often reflects a, a very small ventricle, which as you've heard from the earlier your echo talk is a, is a poor prognostic marker. Systolic blood pressure goes along with that. Um, it seems uh, simple, but as your patients progress, their diuretic requirements will go up. And when a patient says to me, doc, how am I doing? Like, how bad is my disease? I can say, look, you're only on 20 milligrams of Lasix a day. Things are actually pretty good right now. Um, but, you know, we all know that as we have to start adding metolazone, that that's a, a marker that things are not um, uh, going well. And finally, syncope is an important marker. But we, um, we can also use New York Heart Association class, um, it seems, to predict how our patients are going to do with therapy. And um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about tefamidus uh, at this meeting so far. Um, and I, I just think it's, it's useful to remember that our patients with class 3 uh, heart failure in this study did seem to have more hospitalizations. Um, and so it's, it kind of gives you a little bit of an idea when you're talking to your patient about how much benefit are they really going to get from some of these new therapies that your New York Heart Association class is still a useful thing to keep in mind. We can further refine things with biomarkers, and I'll just skip over these quite quickly in the interest of time, but it's been long established in the AL amyloidosis <coughs> literature that um, a staging system based on uh, difference between uh, your free light chains, your troponin, and your BNP or anti-proBNP are, are very useful at uh, stratifying survival time. And similar systems have been developed for ATTR patients more recently. There's one that came out of the National Amyloidosis Center in the UK using NT-proBNB and EGFR. And there's another one out of the Mayo Clinic, again, using you know, BNP and troponin. And these are not as widely used as the AL system is, um, but they do appear to have some prognostic utility. Um, biomarkers can also be useful for monitoring response to therapy. So in AL, a change in your uh, NT-proBNP is the marker of an organ response, and this is, uh, this is associated with improved uh, long-term prognosis. But um, it also seems to be useful in ATTR. And this is some uh, sort of sub-study data from the Apollo trial of patisseran, where they showed that patients who were receiving patisseran were much more likely to have stable or decreased um, NT-proBNP levels compared to those patients who were receiving placebo where you tended to see an increase in NT-proBNP over the course of the study. So this hasn't really been validated yet, but it's a suggestion that these biomarkers might be useful in our ATTR patients as they start to be put on disease-modifying therapies for monitoring that response. But the real purpose of today's talk, of course, is to talk about how imaging can help us uh, further. And so what can imaging add to prognosis in cardiac amyloidosis? Well, when we um, start with echo, there, you've already seen a number of measures, and uh, there's not time in today's session to go through every uh, echo parameter that has been shown to be prognostic. I want to focus on global longitudinal strain because this seems to be emerging, uh, or seems to have emerged by this point, as uh, probably the, the most useful um, echo parameter in patients with amyloidosis, both for uh, the diagnosis and perhaps the prognosis as well. And so in AL amyloidosis, the study demonstrated um, that when you divided uh, global longitudinal strain at approximately negative 15 being your cut point, there was a clear difference in survival and that, when you, that there was an incremental prognostic value even when added to the classic known predictors of, of survival such as free light chain differential, uh, anti-proBNP and troponin. Um, now, if you look at the uh, charts on the right, uh, you can see that this, um, this cutoff actually seemed to perform better in patients who did not have known cardiac amyloidosis, may not have performed quite as well uh, in patients with established cardiac amyloidosis, suggesting that maybe what you're doing here is it's giving you that additional diagnostic benefit. But in any event, among patients with AL amyloidosis, GLS has clear prognostic benefit, or prognostic value, I should say. <clears throat> 
Moving on then to uh, cardiac MRI, um, late gadolinium enhancement is also prognostic. So again, looking at this as a binary marker, you have it or you don't. Um, a, meta, a recent meta-analysis of uh, a number of studies that have looked at this have clearly found that patients with cardiac amyloidosis, both AL and ATTR, have uh, a far worse prognosis if they have late gadolinium enhancement on their uh, MRI. We can further uh, refine this, though, by actually looking at the pattern of gadolinium enhancement. But in both AL and in ATTR, you can see all three patterns of no, no enhancement, subendocardial enhancement, or transmural enhancement. The uh, bar graphs uh, on the top left show that in AL, th there's a, a difference in the distribution of these patterns uh, where ATTR patients seem to be more likely to have transmural, less likely to have no late GAD. Um, but you can see uh, all three patterns in both types, reinforcing what you've heard earlier, which is that this is not useful for making the diagnosis or differentiating types. Um, but what is interesting is that um, this pattern, uh, not surprisingly, seems to correlate with uh, extracellular volume, uh, which is thought to be a surrogate for amyloid burden, and that that in turn is prognostic. And I apologize that these are quite small, but the blue lines on the top show the survival of patients with no late enhancement, the green lines show subendocardial enhancement, and the yellow shows transmural enhancement. You can see that uh, in all patients in the top chart, uh, in AL patients, bottom left, and ATTR on the bottom right, that the pattern of late enhancement clearly differentiates survival among those groups. We can then move on to T1 mapping, and again, this is where I'm not an imager, guys, and so don't ask me to even begin to read these things, but I can tell you that uh, na both native T1 mapping and post-contrast T1 uh, mapping, uh, measuring extracellular volume, uh, are useful uh, in both uh, TTR and uh, AL. And so if you look in uh, ATTR, uh, just looking at uh, native T1 uh, imaging, you can see that uh, although um, it seems to differentiate prognosis somewhat in um, all ATTR subjects in the top left, does this work? Um, when you divide uh, TTR patients into uh, familial or mutant uh, and wild type, it doesn't seem to perform as well. Now you can just say it's probably partly because the numbers become too small to see a significant difference, but um, this does not perform as well as extracellular volume measurements do, which have a more clear separation of the curves and which remains significant even when you separate the, um, the groups into wild type versus uh, hereditary. And so it appears that in AT TTR, um, extracellular volume uh, measurement probably has more prognostic value than native T1 uh, imaging does. Now in AL, again, the same thing has been seen uh, where extracellular volume measurements do seem to be more prognostic than native T1 mapping. Native T1 mapping, you've heard, has value in making the diagnosis. It doesn't seem to be as prognostic in either type of uh, cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, here you can see in AL patients, using a cutoff of ECB of 45, uh, which is different from the cutoff of 40 that you uh, saw, uh, or sorry, 0 0.40 that we saw in making the diagnosis. If you use a slightly higher cutoff of 0.45, then there's actually a hazard ratio of 4.4 uh, for survival, even when accounting for commonly um, sort of established uh, prognostic markers, including ejection fraction, BNP, and diastolic uh, function. What about nuclear scintigraphy? So the pyrophosphate scan, it's a crude sort of a test compared to MRI in terms of uh, the granularity of, of the data that you can get from it. But in fact, if you look at quantitative measurements, the heart to contralateral lung ratio in patients with established ATTR, in fact, that is also prognostic. So using a cut point of 1.6, you can see a difference in survival. Um, now, uh, I should it's important to mention that semi-quantitative uh, measurement, so visual score, does not have prognostic value, probably because the difference uh, between a, a grade two and a grade three is just not fine enough. There's just not enough granularity there to see prognostic uh, difference. But there is some uh, difference among patients who have a higher heart to contralateral lung ratio versus those with a lower one. <laughs> 
Um, the other thing that seems to be interesting about the pyrophosphate scans is that they also uh, have, can have um, variations in the distribution of pyrophosphate uptake. And just like we see in ECHO, there seems to be an apical sparing pattern when you look at SPECT imaging. So this here, you can see on planar imaging, it looks sort of like the whole heart is taking up uh, the tracer. But when you actually look at it on SPECT and map it out uh, by segment, you can see that there is sort of this cherry on top picture here. Um, and so uh, the authors of this paper developed what they call an apical sparing ratio show, which is um, just like the apical to base ratio that is used in ECHO. Uh, and so in the, this patient here would have, for example, an uh, apical sparing ratio of 3.13. And if you use a, that ratio, uh, comparing the uptake at the apex to the uh, uptake at the base, uh, if you use a cutoff of 2.75, then you can see again that there is a difference in survival, suggesting that, um, that as this disease progresses, uh, the uh, the uptake sort of progresses towards the apex, um, and, and that's sort of a marker of more advanced disease. So in my last 12 seconds, I'm just going to talk really briefly about uh, monitoring disease progression. Fortunately, there's far less uh, data in this area. Um, we, we've known for a long time that in patients with AL who undergo stem cell transplant or, or otherwise have their uh, light chains uh, adequately controlled, that we do see uh, improvement in cardiac function, both systolic function, diastolic function, as well as regression of wall thickness. Um, and so this is just sort of a before and after of a patient who had underwent stem cell transplant before on the left and after on the right, and you can see there are clear differences. And you can look at... Um, at, uh, at changes uh, in wall thickness, and so this is showing the patients who, they, who responded and these dramatic differences in their, in their wall thickness. Um, with MRI, you, you can also use uh, late gadolinium enhancement and extracellular volumes as measures of progression or response in AL. This just highlights a patient who regressed uh, and a patient who progressed, and you can see that there are differences there that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Um, and finally, uh, native T1 mapping and extracellular volume in ATTR might be useful. And I just want to just say at this point, as we're entering an era of uh, disease-modifying therapy for TTR, it's going to be really important that we have ways of, of measuring whether our patients are responding or progressing. And there needs to be more work in this area, and I think this is really uh, promising early work. Um, and it makes a lot of sense that extracellular volume would be a good way of doing this, because it really does seem to be a, a surrogate for, for amyloid burden in the, in the heart. Um, and so there's going to be more work coming on this, um, uh, and hopefully uh, it will um, help us to uh, guide patient care. Uh, so with that, um, I'll just say, I'll just summarize by saying don't forget the uh, clinical assessment and biomarkers. That is our, our foundation of assessing uh, prognosis uh, and monitoring our patient's progress. Imaging techniques can certainly add important prognostic information, uh, and there's sort of uh, evolution of the use of uh, imaging for monitoring uh, disease progress and response to therapy. Thank you. So, Margo, maybe I'll just ask one question for you and uh, put you on the spot. We're out, we're out of time here, so, but, uh, you know, you're, you're, as you pointed out, you're the only one uh, on this panel who is not an imager at their, in their day job, so, which is nice because it gives you a uh, position to give an unbiased statement. You don't have a horse in the race like the rest of us. Uh, do patients with cardiac amyloidosis need any surveillance follow-up imaging, and if so, who and how? Do they need it? I don't think they need it. <laughs> I think it's a nice to have, uh, but I think that, um, again, in, you know, in our AL patients who are being treated by hematologists, they have parameters they look at to see whether their patients are responding to therapy. We have not needed to follow that because if the light chains are normalizing, then carry on and you know everything that we see clinically happening is nice and if we can support that with echo changes that's great too but really it's being driven by the hematologic parameters but in TTR we're going to be the ones treating now and we're going to need to know if what we're doing is is working um, biomarkers might be helpful but I think that this is where imaging is going to become more and more important we're looking at you know, we've said it before, expensive drugs, and if we're going to justify continuing to use them to be able to, to show that, that things are staying stable with a really objective measure like amyloid burden or, or a surrogate thereof, then I think that I think that's going to become essential. Okay, one final question from uh, yeah, Dr. Yeah, thank you, Margo. Great presentation. Um, um, and you may have touched on this, but um, do, is there any parameter that's predicting response? 
Like, is there any, and any work on that? Like, in other words, is it fine to predict prognosis, but what we want to know is, is the patient going to actually respond to the drug, right? I mean, and I know there's outcome benefit, but... And you're saying in TTR or in AL? Right, right. In, in, in TTR. Uh, I think that right now, the, what, uh, in terms of imaging parameters, I, I don't think that there is anything that really has, has shown that. It's really early days, but I don't think there's anything. Clinically, we know that the, the, the benefit is, is greatest in patients with less advanced disease, uh, as evidenced by the fact that the class three patients have actually a trend towards more hospitalizations, and what we understand about how the drugs work, which is that they're stabilizing things and not improving things. So that's class three based on symptoms. NYHA class three, right. yes, yeah. But I'm just wondering. On imaging-wise, there is, hasn't been anything that I've I've seen. I, I don't know if anybody else on the panel has seen anything. I haven't seen anything that that's going to predict which patients will will benefit most. Okay. On that note, I'd like to uh, thank uh, my co-chair, the uh, four presenters, for a very excellent, comprehensive uh, review of the various imaging modalities for cardiac amyloid, as well as the clinical manifestations and management. I would uh, appreciate, uh, as a reminder to all the audience members, if you can uh, complete your evaluations of the session. And I'll ask the four speakers to stay uh, for the next five minutes. If you have any questions, please come up to the front. Thank you.